Um, we're going to sing uh, Revive Us Again, all three verses at this time. A solo or I need some three and one old <laughs> <laughs> That's the longest intro I ever heard. I got a million of them Bob. <laughs> Can we start again please? Okay. <laughs> it's JR's fault. JR's fault. He yeah. pixelated me out there in the parking lot. We can't blame JR. I swear I'm not trying to do this. We praise thee, O oh God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone. One hundred and fourteen will be our next hymn. One hundred and fourteen. After this, I'd like to call upon uh, Timmy Lucas, who's minister of the Fifth Avenue Church of Christ, uh, to lead us in our opening prayer. We'll do verses one and four. want to be a worker for the Lord. I want to love and trust His holy word. I want to sing and pray and be busy every day in the kingdom of the Lord. I will work, I will vineyard of the Lord. I will work, I will pray, I will labor every day in the vineyard of the Lord. I want to be a worker, help me Lord, to lead the lost and erring to thy word. That points to joys on high where pleasures never die in the kingdom of the Lord. I will work, I will pray in the vineyard, in the vineyard of the Lord. I will work, I will pray, I will labor every day of the Lord. Let's 
Amen. Amen. Now we'll have a song by Eddie. Peter, do you love me? Go and feed my sheep. And Peter, do you love me? Take care of the weak. And Peter, do you love me? Stand up and be strong. For now I'll have to go away, but I'll not leave you alone. When they took the Lord from the garden, Peter followed them. And someone recognized him and said, there's one of them. Now Peter, he denied him three times in a row. But his heart was broken when he heard the rooster crow. Peter, do you love me? Go and feed my sheep. And Peter, do you love me? Take care of the weak. And Peter, do you love me? Stand up and be strong. For now I'll have to go away, but I'll not leave you alone. Well, along the day of Pentecost, the Comforter arrived. He came in like a rushing wind, like cloven tongues of fire. Peter stood up and began to preach to them the Holy Word. And after 3,000 souls were saved, these words you might have heard. Lord, you know I love you. I'm going to feed your sheep. And Lord, you know I love you. I'll take care of the weak. And Lord, you know I love you. I'm going to be so strong. You sent to me the Holy Ghost. Now I'll never be alone. As Peter grew stronger in his faith, he preached throughout the land. He walked and talked and prayed to God, obeying his command. And then one day he met his faith. They hung him upside down. And in my mind I can hear him as the hammer rang out loud. Lord, you know I loved you. That's why I fed your sheep. And Lord, you know I love you. I've took care of the weak. And Lord, you know I've loved you. That's why I've been so strong. Now thank you, Lord, for using me. Now I'm ready to come home. Amen. <clears throat> Our next congregational song is Victory in Jesus. Those of you who are able to do so, let's stand and sing all three stanzas of this. I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. 
Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. I then obeyed his blessed commands and gained the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the street of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angel singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior. sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. May be seated. Before Eddie comes and blesses us with another song, I do want to introduce uh, Aaron tonight. Although 90% of the people here know who he is because he's had a lot of meetings for us. He reminded me last night that it's been about at least 10 years that he's been coming here for a meeting. And uh, as you can guess, he's one of our favorite evangelists. We love him dearly. I have to love him. He's in our family. But I do love him as a fellow uh, preacher, and uh, he's just such a fine person, a hard worker. I failed to mention last night that uh, he's also uh, the minister of the East Point Church of Christ in Johnson County. Uh, I mentioned that he and his wife are both lawyers, and uh, he has to work in uh, West Virginia. What's the town again? Princeton. Princeton. So he leaves the house at 5 in the morning to go to work. And, uh, and he gets home uh, just in time for prayer meeting on Wednesdays. He gets back home on Mondays. He has to spend a couple of days uh, there because, since the drive is so long. But he also is minister of the East Point uh, Church of Christ. And since he has been there, how many years? Five, six? I've been there since 1949. Okay. okay. And uh, so uh, his, his father-in-law is a contractor. So uh, his father-in-law has remodeled that building 
two times since he's been there to accommodate uh, the crowds that they have. And uh, I enjoy going there to visit the church there. They're very enthusiastic. They have a great uh, youth program, and he's just done such a marvelous uh, job there. I don't know if he has the energy to do all that he does uh, with all the other work that he has to do. Uh, so uh, he's great blessing, not only to us, but anybody who has the opportunity to hear him preach, uh, he's a great blessing. We're thankful for him and his wife, Stephanie, and their three sons who are also with us tonight. At this time, Eddie will bless us with another song, and then Aaron will step forward and have uh, the message tonight. I have seen my last tomorrow I am holding my last breath Goodbye, sweet world of sorrow My new life begins with death and I am standing on the mountain and I can hear the angel songs and I am reaching over Jordan and take my hand Lord lead me home all my burdens they are behind me I have prayed my final prayer so don't you cry over my body Cause that ain't even me lying there oh, I am standing on the mountain And I can hear the angel songs And I am reaching over Jordan, take my hand, Lord, lead me home. And I am standing upon the mountain where I can hear the angel song. And I am reaching over Jordan. Take my hand, Lord, lead me home. And take my hand, Lord, lead me home. Thank you, brother. Good evening. It is great to be with you tonight, and uh, blessing, same. Uh, thank you all for having us, and uh, truly in, in every way a blessing, blessing to be with you all. Um, I want to bring you a message tonight um, about filling the gap. It's going to be a couple verses from Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9 verse 15 and 16. But the idea of filling the gap goes back to the Old Testament. Uh, over in the book of Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse number 30, uh, God said through the prophet Ezekiel, said, I look for a man to stand in, in the gap on behalf of the land, but I not have to destroy it. But I found none. 
There were times in the Old Testament there, were, <clears throat> there was nobody faithful. The prophet Jeremiah said, uh, there's, there's, not a man, there's not a faithful man in Jerusalem. God told Jeremiah the prophet, says, don't even pray for this people. I won't hear your prayer. But yet, through the scripture, God does look for people to stand in the gap, to serve him, to do what's right, to stand against uh, the grain, go against the grain where everybody else is going so that they will stand and do what's right. And I believe that's Noah's story. All the world was evil. It grieved God's heart that he even made man, but Noah was righteous, man. God saw Abram's heart. You know him as father Abraham. Look for man to stand in the gap. Abram, leave your people in your country, Genesis chapter 12, God said, and go to the land I will show you. He loaded up his stuff and went because God said to go. I think through the scripture, there's, God's looking for people, ordinary people, messed up people, just like you and me, that he can do amazing things with. Isn't that David's story? Little shepherd boy, go to check on his brothers, ends up <clears throat> killing a giant. God's looking for the unlikely to do the unbelievable. You know what I mean? And I think the Apostle Paul really fits in that same description. In Acts chapter 9, uh, Saul of Tarsus, as his name is in Acts 9, uh, Saul is on his way to Damascus when he's blinded by a brilliant light. He hears the voice from heaven. In fact, it was Jesus that spoke to him. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goat. He's blinded. He's inside the city of Damascus because Jesus told him, said, go and you'll be told what you must do. He goes into the city of Damascus. He's blind for three days. He's fasting. He's praying. And in Acts chapter 9, verse 15, the Lord said to Ananias, the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Let's pray. Father in heaven, all of your words, all of your words are true. We thank you for your love, your mercy, and what your word teaches us the way that you have chose this plan that you so loved the world, you gave us your son so that our souls could be saved. We thank you for your love, your mercy, your kindness. We thank you for this opportunity to, to serve you, to be here tonight in this revival meeting. We pray you're pleased, you're glorified with all that's said and done here. We pray for increase both in our faith and in our number because we recognize all the increase belongs to, it comes from you. And we pray for increase tonight. We pray, Lord, you'll help us to see how you could use us, even us, to stand in the gap and to serve you in a powerful way. Not anything we do in and of ourselves, but your power in us. All for your glory. We pray it all in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. In the book of Acts... <clears throat> Acts, of course, right after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four Gospels, 89 chapters. The Acts of the Apostles is how these men who followed Jesus, met with Jesus, knew Jesus personally. They took his message, and truly, by the time you get over in the book of Acts, they, these men have turned the world upside down. The book of Acts tells us how this happens. But as these men, the disciples of Jesus, they begin sharing this message Jesus is alive. The one who was put to death is now raised back to life. This gospel message. The Jewish people, they didn't like to hear it. They expected any time, any day, they would be finding, they would find the location of a stinking corpse. And as time went on, they found no body, no body of Jesus. They had no explanation. There were people who were receiving healing. I don't know, Acts chapter 3, the time of prayer, 3 in the afternoon, Peter and John said, silver and gold, I do not have what I have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk! And that old boy got up walking, leaping, praising God when in the temple courts. They had no explanation for it. In Acts chapter 5, if Peter's shadow, the apostle Peter, that her brother sang about a moment ago, if his shadow 
gospel fell on sick, uh, uh, fell on sick people who they laid out by the road, those sick people could be healed. I mean, there was some stuff going on there in the New Testament church for which there was no scientific explanation. Both Peter and Paul, they actually raised the dead. Dorcas was raised in Acts chapter 9 by Peter. Paul, was raised in, uh, Paul raised Eutychus in Acts chapter 20. There's no explanation for what's going on in the New Testament church throughout the book of Acts. And Paul is involved, but this is a story here tonight. A story of how uh, the most unlikely God uses to pull off the truly unbelievable. Early in the book of Acts, you find the apostles, because Peter and John are involved with the healing of the crippled man, uh, they're arrested in Acts chapter 3. They're interrogated in Acts chapter 4. And the Jewish leader said, don't you teach or preach anymore in the name of Jesus. And Peter and John said, do your head like this right here. <laughs> Is that in there? Did they do your head? No. That's not in there. But what they said was, in Acts 4 around verse 19, it says, judge for yourself. Whether it is right in God's sight for us to obey you rather than God, we cannot help speaking about what we've seen and heard. Peter and John, just in the face of threats, they're going to be beaten. They said, we're going to do what God has instructed us to do. In Acts chapter 5, the apostles were beaten. They were arrested, all the apostles. They were beaten, and Acts 5 verse 41 says, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for his name. I mean, they're, they're preaching the gospel, even when they're threatened, even when they're beaten. In Acts chapter 7, actually, you see how it escalates. It was threats, it was beating, and by Acts chapter 7, they're even shedding blood. And that's really where we find the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen preaches a phenomenal sermon, really summarizes a large part of the Old Testament. Stephen, who had been appointed in Acts chapter 6, we recognize that's where the deacons were established in Acts chapter 6. And deacon was, uh, Stephen was one of those men to serve, full of the Holy Spirit. But in Acts chapter 7, he's arrested. And in the middle of this arrest and this interrogation, then Stephen preaches a sermon. And because of what he preached, namely the gospel, he told them, you all rejected, your ancestors rejected Moses, and now you've rejected Jesus, he's the Holy One. You have killed the Christ. His blood's on your hands. The Bible says they picked up stones, they rushed, closing their ears. And they stoned him to death, Acts chapter 7. And we find Paul there because the Bible says, well, it says they laid their clothes in Acts chapter 7, about verse 56 and following. It says they laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. If you want to know what he was doing, you can read that account as Paul told it. Of course, Luke wrote the book of Acts, but in Acts 22, verse number 30, Paul said there, Acts 22, verse number 30, Paul said, I was guarding the clothes of those who were stoning Stephen. You see what happens. Stephen's preaching. They're getting more and more angry, more and more infuriated, and they got coats on. They take their coats off. They got their money in there, their wallets in there, their smartphone is in there. They got everything in the coat. You cannot throw rocks good if you've got your coat on. They take their coats off. They lay their clothes, and the guy that they appointed to guard their coats was Saul of Tarsus. And this guy was church enemy numero uno. He's, he's number one. He's the baddest dude they got. How bad was he? I'm glad you asked. In the book of Acts, chapter 8, verse number 1, it says Saul began uh, breathing and screaming out murderous threats, uh, threats against the Lord's church. In Acts chapter 8, verse 3, it says Saul began to destroy the church. <laughs> Hold on a second. <clears throat> now, Brother Aaron, Saul, he actually, his name was changed to Paul. He actually wrote half the books in the New Testament. Do your head like this right here. And when we find him in Acts 8, verse 3, 
Saul began to destroy the church. You know, all the apostles, all the apostles have been given order. Just before Jesus ascended into heaven, as recorded in Matthew 28 and Mark 16, before he ascends into heaven, also recorded by Luke in Acts chapter 1, before he ascends into heaven, he says, Go, go into the all world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's the way it's worded, Mark 16, verse 15. Go preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who believes not will be condemned. That's what Jesus said. And do you see that of all the apostles, there ain't not one of them, it doesn't seem not a single one of them is trying to go to Saul of Tarsus to convert that guy. Well, why not? He's crazy. He's trying to kill us. Saul of Tarsus was totally convinced, thoroughly, entirely. Jesus of Nazareth, he, he might have been some type of teacher, obviously he was a teacher, some type of, some people say miracle worker. I believe it was all a hoax. But whatever he was, he was not the Christ. That is blasphemy. Saul of Tarsus was convinced. He was a child of Abraham. He had studied under the feet of Gamaliel. We find Gamaliel in Acts chapter 5. Also mentioned in Galatians chapter 1 there. But uh, he was an esteemed Jewish scholar and Paul had studied under him. He knows the law of Moses inside and out. He's got the answers. He knows the prophets. And he's convinced Jesus is not the Christ. Nobody's converting him. He's, he's causing trouble in the church, breathing out murderous threats. And he's having tremendous success. In Acts chapter 26, he tells his own testimony, Paul does, and he says, uh, he said, I tried to force people to blaspheme the name of Jesus. What does that look like? We really don't know exactly. It appears that he was trying to, he would threaten people. Will you deny? Will you deny that Jesus is the Christ? If not, we're going to take action. Now, maybe he tortured people. Did he waterboard people? I don't know. thought that was at Guantanamo Bay. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know when that started. I don't know what, he, what methods he used. What I do know is he tried to force people to blaspheme the name of Jesus. I mean, he stayed awake at night trying to uh, think about how he could stop the work of Christ and the Christian movement. Nobody's trying to convert Saul of Tarsus. It's a lost cause. That's what the apostles saw. That's what the church saw. And if you were there, that's what you would see too. But that's not what God saw. You see that? You, you remember when uh, over in the Old Testament, turns out the God who wrote the New Testament, he wrote the Old Testament too. You thought about that? David, in the Old Testament, uh, Samuel, Samuel went to Jesse's house. David's daddy's name was Jesse. And the Holy Spirit had told Samuel that one of Jesse's sons would be the next king of Israel. And, and Jesse had his sons there. Uh, everybody but David, why? Well, he was the runt of the litter. And somebody's got to keep the sheep, so we'll leave him out there. So all of, his, all of Jesse's sons are there except for David. And when Samuel saw the oldest, he said, Surely, surely the Lord's anointed is before me today, Samuel said. And the Holy Spirit said, Do your head like this right here. No, uh -uh. no, the Holy Spirit said in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, the Holy Spirit says, man, God does not look at the outward appearance the way that man does. God looks at the inside. He looks at the heart. That's what he did in 1 Samuel 16. That's what he does in Acts chapter 9. And that's what God still does today. And when nobody else is trying to convert Saul of Tarsus, God says, that's my man. And Jesus appears on the road to Damascus, a brilliant light. He actually talks to Saul. Saul writes about this in the New Testament. He says, I'm one born out of, in due season. Out of, out of a, a regular, the way everybody else had it. You know what I'm saying? His conversion unlike any other. Jesus appears, Jesus talks to him. And Jesus tells him expressly, go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. Saul gets up, 
according to Acts chapter 9, and he goes into the city of Damascus. The Bible does not say, the NIV does not say that he was fasting. What it says was he didn't eat or drink for three days. <laughs> and at East Point, that's, that's what we call fasting. If you don't eat and you don't drink, you're fasting. That's, that's what it is. He, he's fasting for three days. He has seen Jesus. And when Ananias, that's the, that's the Jewish believer there who had converted to Christianity, when Ananias was told, go to, to Saul, Ananias originally objects. He says, Lord, I've heard how much harm he's done to your church in, in Jerusalem. <laughs> Lord, you don't know this guy the way I know this guy. Let me tell you what I heard about him. And the Lord said where we started, Acts 9 verse 15, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings. Ananias went into Damascus. When he found on Straight Street, he found Saul. He said, Brother Saul, they were both Jewish brothers, you know. Brother Saul, what are you waiting for? Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash your sins away. That's the way Paul wrote it. Acts 22, well, Luke wrote it, but Paul said it, Acts 22, 16. Arise, be baptized, and wash your sins away. B water can't wash away anybody's sins, but Jesus' blood can. And when you're united with Christ, your sins spiritually washed away. And that's the way he described it. I don't want to say more about it than what Paul said, but I don't want to say this. In Galatians 3, he said, all of us who were baptized into Christ have clothed ourselves with Christ. You've put on his righteousness when? Baptism. In Colossians 2, he says, uh, verse 11 and 12 says, it's the circumcision of the heart. Jesus Christ circumcised the hearts of men and women. Your hearts are circumcised when? Starts with billions with baptism. Baptism. Colossians 2, verse 11 and 12. Uh, Paul said in Romans chapter 6, he said that is where we are united with Christ in his death. Baptism. Paul wrote all that. I'm just telling you what the Bible says about it. Galatians 3, Colossians 2, Romans 6. And that's just three places. But his life, though, is never the same. He's on fire now for the cause of Christ. And he's going teaching and preaching now about Jesus. The Bible says in Acts chapter 9, it says he baffled. I like that. He baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. <laughs> you know, this guy had studied. I said Gamaliel a moment ago. That's Acts chapter 5. We find him. He was an esteemed scholar. Also mentioned Galatians 1. But uh, he was a very wise man, even as we see him in the scripture in Acts chapter 5. Studying from the law of Moses, these guys spent their lives devoted, studying, memorizing the scripture. He would have known the law of Moses pretty well inside and out. Paul wrote about the law of Moses in Galatians 3 and verse 24. He said the law was a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. The more you know about the Old Testament, the more you're going to learn about Jesus. So important. And when you first become a Christian, you don't need the Old Testament to become a Christian. That's true. But the more you know about the Old Testament, the more you'll understand about your Christ and about God Almighty, the Father in Heaven. It's so important. And Paul says, the law was a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. And you've got a guy who understands, the Apostle Paul. He understands the entire Old Testament was leading us to the Messiah. The entire Old Testament. The law of Moses Leviticus 17, verse 11, in, in the law, book of, of Leviticus, the law of Moses, Leviticus 17, God said through Moses, Moses wrote it, the life of the animal is in the blood. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life on the altar. I, mean, I don't know, we should maybe sing a song. Like, There's power in the blood. You ever heard that? This guy knows the apostle Paul knows sin required blood. As you study through the law of Moses, there, there were sacrifices. There were drink offerings and grain offerings and free will offerings. And any kind of offering dealt with sin, the sin offering was always blood. Blood had to be shed. From the time of Adam and Eve sin in the garden, they made clothes out of fig leaves, but God made them clothes of animal skins 
The Greek word for skins there, it's actually, not Greek rather, but the Hebrew word for animal skins is actually hide, it's leather. And it's important because when we see it over in the beginning, there was no, there were no carnivores in the beginning. According to the Bible, the animals, Adam and Eve, they were given every plant to eat. No blood had been shed according to Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. No blood had been shed, but now Adam and Eve have sinned. They've transgressed against God. Now they're guilty. And God gives them leather coat. Adam's was leather and Eve's was fur, but it was animal skins. I don't know what it was. And as they put on this coat for the first time, they got to imagine this animal died because I sinned. Life was taken, blood was shed. The law of Moses, they would have a, a early, the early morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice. I've read in history, Old Testament history, it would actually happen at nine in the morning and three in the afternoon. It's funny that the time that they nailed Jesus to the tree was nine in the morning and the time that he, he died on the tree at Calvary was three in the afternoon. But that's for another sermon. There's all kinds of sacrifices. When Solomon... Solomon actually built the temple according to 2 Chronicles chapter 7 when he threw a big party, the dedication of the Lord's temple in Jerusalem. The Bible says they sacrificed 120,000 sheep and goats. Ooh. <laughs> the logistics of how you would even accomplish that is, is hard for us to... How do you sacrifice 120,000? Woo! Blood is required for sin. Sin requires blood. And you've got a guy who spent his life devoted to the law of Moses and now he understands the blood that the entire Old Testament was pointing to was fulfilled with the Christ. He's not a phony. He's the Lord of... The King of kings, Lord of lords. Lord of all the earth. And what the Hebrew writer said, I believe... Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, and if you don't believe that, you have the right to be wrong. It's okay. But in the book of Hebrews, the Bible does say uh, in Hebrews, what is it, chapter 9, verse 22, I believe it is, the law, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, remission. Absolutely. You've got a guy who understands what John the Baptist declared. Hold or look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Preacher, that sounds like the message we preached last night about grace. Do you have it? right. <laughs> and if the Lord allows us to come back tomorrow, we're going to preach about it again. <laughs> this guy who knows sins paid for and paid in full through the Christ what Paul did right, as we studied last night, I'll remind you just now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, God, God made him who knew no sin, Jesus Christ, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. He became sin. Our sin, the wrath, God's wrath for our sin was placed on him. Our sins paid for and paid in full. That's the message Paul's preaching. This guy who was murderous, breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's church, guarding the clothes of Stephen. The guy who was causing destruction now understands. Man, let me tell you something. He set the world on fire. <laughs> he, he became the most fiery advocate for the gospel maybe the world's ever seen. And everywhere he goes, he's preaching the good news. And what he says in Acts 20, verse 24, he says, I consider, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Even his own life. Is my life worth nothing to me? And as a Jewish scholar, to, to study at the feet of Gamaliel, that's equivalent to like Ivy League education. It's like going to Harvard and Yale. I mean, you're, you're set. All he's got to do is behave himself and stay off Twitter, and he's, he's got it made, you know what I'm saying? And the Bible says, according to Philippians chapter 3, says that uh, 
Whatever was to my gain, Paul said, I now consider as lost. And when you read into the verbiage he uses in Philippians, he says, I now count it as dung. Fecal matter. I don't know how much clearer we can say it here. Everything that was going, I was going places. I had it made. I was financially set and secure. I now consider it all waste so that I can know Christ. Moreover, everywhere he goes, he's in trouble. Have you noticed that about Paul? He becomes a jailbird. He's on the run. You read about it in 2 Corinthians 11 from his own countrymen, from enemies. He's cold. He's naked. He's shipwrecked. He's hungry. He's thirsty. But he's still preaching the gospel. In Acts 14, they stoned him, thought he was dead, left him. Turned out he was come back for more. He came back to life. I don't know if he really was dead for a moment. Some people opine that maybe possibly he had this out-of-body experience. I don't know. I just know he, he wasn't done in Acts 14. He was stoned and left for dead. He's preaching the gospel. And I challenge you, you find me a place where the Apostle Paul ever, find me a place in the New Testament, wrote half the books in there, find me a place where he ever complained. Find me one. You chain him up in Roman jail cell, he sends the church to Philippi, he sends it to Rome, and what he says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again. Rejoice. <laughs> Pardon me, sir. You're jailed, you're locked in a chain, a jail cell in Rome. Rejoice in the Lord. In Philippi, when he was there in Acts 16, they actually arrested him and they, they beat him and his companion Silas and, and they're, they have them beaten severely and chained up at midnight. What are they doing? Singing hymns of praise. <laughs> Woo! He's never complaining. Lord, <clears throat> Peter and John got it pretty easy in Jerusalem, Lord. Why couldn't I have it a little bit more like Peter and John, you know? He, he never said that. In, in fact, he's concerned about preaching the gospel of Christ. Some people preach out of false means. They're, they're phonies. But what, and some people, some people preach it genuinely, but what does it matter? Paul says, so long as Christ is preached. He was centered around doing the will of God, preaching the good news. And when he says about his own history in Philippians chapter 3, he says, he says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. That was his history. And he knew what it was really about the entire Old Testament, his entire history, he nearly missed it. It was really about this Jesus fellow who really was God in the flesh, who really in the fullness of time, Paul said in the Galatian letter, chapter 3, I believe it is, in the fullness of time, God sent us his son. Chapter 4 it is, born of a woman, born under the law. God sent his son in the fullness of time, sin paid for, paid in full, so that we can be set free. And when Paul taught, when Paul uh, reasoned with people, he, he would say and did say to the church at Corinth, he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, he said, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. And the way he explained that to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 6 in verse number 2, verse 1 maybe you might remember, but Romans 6 verse 1 says, Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. Absolutely not. Verse 2 says, You have died to sin. Notice how he explains the transformation. He was once against Christ. He was once public enemy, church enemy number one. And now he's the greatest follower of Christ. And he explains his transformation for all of us. If you're in Christ, you're dead to sin. When I, when I hear that line, I think about going down to like a funeral home. You know what I'm saying? We've all surely been down to the funeral home and we know what it's like to see a casket and a, a, a body inside. Isn't it funny how behavior changes once somebody's in that casket? You know what I mean? 
You can take the world's worst kleptomaniac. I mean, absolute steal you blind. Steal your shirt off your back while you're wearing your shirt. You know what I'm saying? You can take the world's worst kleptomaniac and when he's cold, stone dead in that casket, you could stack $100 bills on his chest all the way to the ceiling and he ain't going to take a one. You notice that? You can take the world's worst gossip. She probably belongs to a church somewhere. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? Uh, you can take a world's worst gossip. Couldn't trust her or him with anything you could tell them. Tell everything they know. But when they're stone cold dead at the funeral home, you can go up right there and whisper your most egregious sin right in her ears. They ain't going to tell nobody. You see, you can take somebody, you get the picture. You take somebody who's a sex offender, absolutely cannot keep his hand to himself. You can have Miss America walk by the casket in a bikini contest and he ain't even going to look. You get the picture. How many more illustrations we need? See? Paul said, you have died to sin. That's his story. What he was was a murderer. What he became, a fiery advocate. God looks at the inside. God looks at the heart. That's Moses' story. That's Joshua's story. That's David's story. Isn't that Peter and John's story? And James and Matthew, the tax collector, Matthew, the tax collector, everybody hated him, worked for the IRS. Jesus saw potential in everything. What he saw with his apostles, the original 12, he also saw with Saul of Tarsus. And truthfully, I believe with all my heart, he sees in us too. The world sees the outside and sees the failure that we are and the mess we make of things. But God and all of his power and infinite wisdom, he, he is the inside. And he sees potential. When God called Moses at the burning bush and said, uh, I need you to go back. I've seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I've heard their groaning. I've come down to set them free. When God talked to Moses, Moses said, I, I can't talk. In the book of Acts in chapter number 7 when Stephen preached in Acts 7 he says Moses, Moses was powerful in speech and action. See Moses thought he couldn't talk. And God said oh yes you can. <laughs> God is greater than all your weaknesses and all your failures. God wants to use you for his glory. In Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, the prophet says in chapter 43, he says, God says through the prophet, says, bring my sons, Isaiah 43, verse 7 and 8, bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, who I formed and made. God made you for his glory. He's got a plan. You say, I, I can't do it. I, I couldn't speak. I can't sing real good. I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. And God says, quit doubting and trust me. He's looking for people to stand in the gap. The world truly, it's going to hell in a handbasket. You know that. You can turn on the news any channel you want. You see it. Things are getting progressively worse all the time. God's looking for people to go against the grain, to stand firm people of faith and what God did with Saul of Tarsus he can do with you and that is the gospel message I want to close with a final thought from Isaiah chapter 5 God describes in the prophet Isaiah chapter 5 God describes a vineyard and he says I planted the vineyard I prepared the soil I planted the seed I did everything I could do to make it grow but the, the vineyard has not grown. In Isaiah 5, verse number 4, God says, What more could have been done for my vineyard than I've done for it? And in our world today, literally, your birthday is based on the existence of Jesus Christ. The calendar is based on His existence. There are orphanages and uh, hospitals 
that all uh, denote the fact that they have Christian origin. I don't know what they believe today, but I know you can't go through any city we got in this country where you don't find some type of Christian outreach. Based on his existence, the school system, the public school system from 1640s Massachusetts, the old Satan Deluder Act, it was how to confuse the work of Satan. They decided to teach their kids scripture. Ha <laughs> ha! Since then, we've kicked God out of school. But originally, he was allowed in. You know what I'm saying? What more could he do for us than has been done? And nowadays, uh, we all got these phones. You know who the smartest guy in the room is? The guy with the fastest phone. He's the smartest guy in the room. Jerry Bliffin's brother has been to Papua New Guinea, a very poor country, third world country, over in the South Pacific. Um, everybody has a smartphone. They don't, they don't have any means to charge it. They got to get on a public bus, ride two hours so they can charge their phone. <laughs> but they got smartphones. Do you know what that means? Anybody, anybody who wants to know who God is, you can go to, for example, blueletterbible.com. You can find the Greek word for every word in the New Testament. You can find out what it means and how many times it's used and exactly what the Bible says. Anybody that wants to know who God is, everybody's got it at the tip of their finger. Can you hear what God says? What more could be done for my vineyard than what I've done for it? He purchased your soul with the blood of his son. He's, he's shown from Moses to David to the apostle Paul. He's able to fill the gap. Your weaknesses may be what attract to him to you. He designed you. He's got people you can reach. If only you surrender to his cause. As Bruce comes up, as Bob comes up, the invitation to follow Christ, the same gospel message that Paul preached, what, what Paul preached in Acts 26, verse number 20, he said, I preached... I preach they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. And that's still what we preach today. It's only the grace of God can save anybody. Jesus plus nothing else. But if you love Jesus, you obey his commands. Because that's the way he said it worked. John 14, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. That you can become a follower of Christ, being washed in the blood of Jesus. You can make a confession, repenting of your sins. You can be born again, you know, through faith. If you have a decision to recommit your life, to be born again, any decision. As we all stand tonight and as we sing, if you have a decision, won't you come?